Mark's Classic Rock, Q1043. You don't often hear about people surviving pancreatic cancer. You hear the words pancreatic cancer and you think death sentence. My daughter's father died of pancreatic cancer six years ago. With me this morning, Josh Mailman, a 15-year survivor of pancreatic cancer, neuroendocrine pancreatic cancer. Also with us, Dr. Richard Wall, a nuclear medicine physician. First of all, Josh, it is so wonderful having you on today. Please just share your story with us, because when I just saw it in print, I think my mouth fell open. So, I, you know, my... My story starts in, in 2007 as an accidental pickup as a 46 year old going for your annual exam, which I really recommend everyone do. And um, my doctor felt something a little unusual under my rib cage and didn't think much of it. I was pretty good. I was uh, biking 120 miles a week all over the place and I felt fine. And, um, you know, later on, she sent me for an ultrasound about four weeks later and, and saw this huge softball sized mass over my pancreas. And it, it does turn out there are different forms of pancreatic cancer. Um, the one that we're most familiar with is, um, is, is, as you point out, rather um, deadly and, and, and does take people rather quickly. Um, but there are different types. I have something called a neuroendocrine tumor. It's the same thing that um, Steve Jobs and Aretha Franklin um, had. It's a, it's a form that happens for 5% um, of those with uh, a pancreatic mass. In, uh, and there are some different types of treatments for that. And back then, this was 2007, um, there weren't very many treatments for me at the, at the time. And I had to go exploring and looking for things. And um, I found, I met a doctor actually in Toronto, Can um, Canada at a conference um, who Dr. Wall knows really well. Um, and he was giving a talk and, uh, and as Dr. Wall was talking in our, in our kind of pre-show, I'm a tech head and I like more data. And this doctor was talking about these new nuclear imaging kind of diagnostics that can look and see more things. And I found that really fascinating. And I traveled to Germany to go um, have this, what was then a radically new scan in 2008. And it led to this um, exploration into nuclear medicine and a new form of treatment, which you know is a little complicated, but it's called PRT, um, uh, peptide radio receptor therapy. And it's kind of like a smart bomb for cancer. And your cancer cells can have these um, receptors or things that nuclear medicine can target. And if, you're, um, if you need to see it, you put like a light bulb on it and it goes to the cancer and you can see it in imaging. Dr. Wall will explain that in a second. And if you can see it, you can potentially treat it. And you switch out the light bulb for, uh, I call it a nuclear bomb, but, um, you know, a smart bomb. And so the next time you're, you're treating, you're giving this, you know, smart precision, really precision. It's going to where the receptors on your cancer are and really just dealing with that. Um, you know, the traditional methodology in oncology is to give you chemotherapy, which goes everywhere. It might kill the fast growing cells, but everything kind of picks it up. And this, um, th these advancements, which, you know, we, we talk about advancements, it's slow in coming. It's been 80 years in, in the making, so to speak, but this one, particularly 25 years um, or 20, uh, thir almost 30 years since the first in human for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor um, really targets the, um, the particular cancer. And it turns out neuroendocrine tumors really overexpress these kind of receptors that can be targeted with smart bombs. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit because um, uh, I know we're going to get into many things here. But um, this this area now, you know, it worked really well with me. I'm I'm here 15 years later. My life expectancy was a little longer than traditional um, pancreatic um, uh, cancer, but you know, the my five year survival rate should have been less than five percent. So wow. I'm I'm still here. It's 15 years later. Um, and now 
taking that knowledge, we're about to have this explosion in, and probably not the greatest use of terms, explosion with nuclear, but that, that's all right. I'll, I'll let Dr. Wall work on that part. But um, we're about to have this immense amount of new technology that's based off the same thing. We're, we're, we've just gotten several um, new imaging for prostate cancer, for metastatic prostate cancer. Um, we have a, a, a phase three trial that just completed and prostate cancer as well that uses the same radio ligand therapy, it's called, to target that. And now, and I'll let Dr. Walls speak to this, but we have um, we have new targets that look at many, many cancers, including the ones that um, um, took your, your family member as well in, in, in pancreatic cancer. Um, and, and these are things that are coming in the future. And and Dr. Wall, I've talked a lot here, and maybe I'll I'll let you kind of clean up what I've what I've set up. But it's been a remarkable journey from, um, like probably many in your audience, never hearing the word nuclear medicine or having have a a thought, and all of a sudden needing it, and all of a sudden learning about this whole new world of things that can be targeted with precision. So it's been a fascinating journey for me. Um, Doc, Dr. Wall, uh, are there Side effects of this, I mean, there, you know, the side effects of chemotherapy are well known and, and a lot of people go through radiation and really don't have side effects, but there could be side effects there. What about this type of treatment? Well, uh, this nuclear medicine is sort of divided up, as Josh said, into a couple of, of elements of the process. One, one is the diagnostic scan, the, the, the nuclear medicine scan, which is often a PET scan, and that's the scan that basically has no side effects at all. It's a, it's a low dose of a, uh, of a tracer molecule that will seek out and accumulate in cancers that express the receptor. So it, in Josh's case, the receptor is, is imaged within an hour by injecting a, a PET scanning agent. And this, this is, nuclear medicine sounds scary. That diagnostic part is done uh, all the time. And we have diagnostic agents in common diseases FDG PET is one, so that the diagnostic uh, doesn't really have any significant side effects. And the amount of radiation somebody's exposed to is about like flying from uh, New York to Los Angeles. It's, a, it's something within the range of what we typically receive. Now, the therapeutic dose, um, I, the short answer is in general, radiopharmaceutical therapies like Josh received have fewer side effects than chemotherapy because it's the specific targeting. But one has to be careful. I mean, there is not completely without side effects, but the side effect profile is generally very, very good relative to other forms of therapy. Uh, the, mar the bone marrow may be suppressed a bit, but in, in, in fatigue may briefly occur. But I think um, Josh can probably speak to his own individual experience as to what he was able to do, uh, how, how many days he had to wait before he could ride his bike again. Uh, but, but these are generally quite well tolerated therapies because they are so specifically targeted. So is this used now on w which types of cancer is this used for in terms of treatment? Because all this is new to me yeah. and I'm a breast cancer survivor of two well, years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so the diagnostic side of nuclear medicine, the, especially the pet in cancer is used in almost every kind of cancer. Um, I mean, it's used in breast cancer. It's approved by uh, FDA and Medicare for, for breast cancer in specific applications. Um, so the, the number of cancers in which the therapy is used is more limited. Um, and that's why but we're very excited that the number of opportunities for expanding this kind of therapy are, are increasing. So Josh <laughs> mentioned, I think 70 years, 80 years, one of the old standbys is treating thyroid cancer. And uh, so, so iodine, radioactive iodine, has been used for, for, for many decades to treat thyroid cancer. That's, that's one. Neuroendocrine tumors, another one. Another kind we treat are liver cancers where there's metastatic disease to the liver or primary uh, liver disease where we can put radioactive molecules right into the liver with, with a catheter and treat those. The other place where there's approved agents that prolong survival uh, can include non-Hodgkin's lymphoma where there are radio-labeled antibodies that are approved and which increase survival and are quite well tolerated. I, I might also add underutilized and one of the other places where there's a lot of excitement are approved and emerging agents for prostate cancer, which is, as you know, quite common, 
and, and it kills uh, men by metastases. So there are therapies that prolong survival in patients with metastatic prostate cancer that have very favorable uh, toxicity profiles. So, And how many treatments do you need? I know it would vary depending on the type of so cancer and severity. The, the interesting thing I, I found out is, is I got into this and then became an advocate in nuclear medicine is that you know, one of the things that we, we see is that these treatments are durable. They last a long time. They, you know, for, for me, there are now more approved agents than there were when I was first diagnosed for my disease, um, both uh, nuclear medicine and others, but this is more durable. The, um, um, we talk about progression-free survival or how long you do before your disease progresses. Not all of these things are cured yet, um, but this is about a three-year progression-free survival. You might have four treatments over the course of a year, and then it might be three, four, five years before you need to see um, uh, another type of treatment. And in my case, um, after I had my first treatment in 2009, I did not need to, um, I didn't progress. I'm actually, my disease regressed, which is a good thing, but I didn't progress for another six till 2016, where I had a single treatment and I was actually stable to 2020, which, so these, these treatments are really durable, which, um, you know, we're in the U S and, and we, we're, we're blessed in North America to have fairly, fairly good health coverage and, and health. But, um, one of the great things about radioiodine and why it's practiced all over the planet is because you can take two treatments or one treatment and have these durable responses. So um, that that will last years and decades. And this is one of the reasons why nuclear medicine is so interesting because, you know, we're all somewhere between an hour, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to a medical facility. But if you start going to the de developing world, they're far away from any medical treatment and they may only get to see a patient once or twice. And so you have some of these amazingly durable treatments that can last decades um, and that really changes um, uh, health in, in the developing world. I mean, so, I, uh, it, so yeah, uh, let me just ask you this, both of you. So if somebody is, you know, because people, my listeners are diagnosed with cancer all the time. Is this something you should ask your doctor right off the bat? What about nuclear medicine? Because frankly, like I said, I had not even heard of nuclear medicine. I could not conceive what is this? Well, luckily, your 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 listeners live in a in a pretty populated town that has um, that has some excellent centers around it that are starting to um, uh, use this more and more often. So asking is 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 a good idea, and they'll let you know what your whether it's Memorial Sloan Kettering or um, Columbia or NYU. They'll all. Um, have really great nuclear medicine departments, and they're starting. We, we're just we saw an approval for my disease for therapy in 2017. Um, I we anticipate that we'll see an approval for this metastatic prostate cancer um, within uh, hopefully um, early next year. So we'll start seeing it um, uh, in in prostate cancer early early next year. There are some incredible clinical trials going on in different types of um, diseases as well that you should ask your doctor about if, um, in general about clinical trials. Um, and your, your, your listeners and you Asian probably had a nuclear medicine diagnostic test without even knowing about it because you just went in for a PET CT. They said FTG, which is a fancy word for a sugar pet. Um, and you had a, probably a sugar pet to see where that disease was, um, which is the, one of the most common used um, versions of a diagnostic test um, as well. So it's happening. You may not know it's happening, but it's happening right where, where you are and, and understanding what's going on is a great thing because I'm, I'm okay, about patient we're, education. We're, we're out of time. Just no very worries. quickly, how do, how do they find out more? Where to, where to go? Well, the Society of Nuclear Medicine has an excellent website. Uh, I would say the, the Society of Nuclear Medicine website is really good, and it has a patient uh, portal. And uh, we have a, an area called uh, Radiopharmaceutical Therapy Central on that website. 
I'd say that's a good place. It has a lot of information. It talks about the different diseases where there are currently FDA approved therapies. Um, and, and again, I answer your question as Josh did. Yes, you should ask your uh, physician about nuclear medicine. And, and if your referring physician is not a, a aware of it, do some research yourself. Um, don't hesitate to seek out a nuclear medicine specialist as well. I think this technology is probably not fully appreciated, you know, because it, the name sounds odd and maybe scary, but nuclear medicine is actually a really safe technique. And to Josh's point, it does, results may vary. Obviously, the, the, the prostate cancer, for instance, one of the agents that's FDA approved, definitely, uh, and that's radium dichloride, a simple injection, the stuff that Marie Curie was using over 100 years ago, turns out it, it does prolong life in patients with metastatic prostate cancer, but it's by, it's by a number of months, but with an exceedingly good quality of life. So it's not always that you get many years, but, but our traditional ones like iodine-131, many years of longer survival, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, several years. Yeah, life. so Shelly, just one thing, discover MI. It, org is one of the URLs and SNMI, um, Society of Nuclear Med um, SNMMI.org is the other. So those are the two URLs, SNMMI.org and discovermi.org will get you to, um, to all of them. And it's been such a pleasure talking to you. And to you as well, Dr. Richard Wall and Josh Mailman. And I'll see you guys tomorrow morning on the Jim Kerr Rock and Roll Morning Show, Q104.3. Classic Rock, Q1043.